Welcome into the latest episode of the Five Reasons Podcast. I'm here, as almost always, with Chris Whittingham. We're going to do a heat episode today. It's been quite a while, but make sure you check out the other podcasts in our network, in addition to Miami Heat Beat, which we'll be posting, as usual, this week. Three Yards Per Carry just came out with its Ryan Fitzpatrick special, so make sure that you check that out. Ryan Fitzpatrick, the new starting quarterback, I believe, of the Miami Dolphins, and it was interesting to hear Eric Reed, Jets fan, on the Heat broadcast yesterday, pumping up Dolphin fans. About I'm not supposed to tell Ryan people that Eric Patrick. Reed, our beloved Eric Reed, is a Jets fan. We're not. We're not only is he a Jets fan. Not <laughs> only is he a Jets fan, but but a few years ago, actually, I spoke to him because the Jets were very interested in hiring him as their radio voice. Wow! I don't know if everybody knows that. Yeah, it was a dream job, and obviously he's from that area, but he he passed on it. So, but can he can you imagine a Miami Heat lifer? Can you imagine? If we lose our beloved Eric Reed to the New York Jets, the outrage from the fan. Like, I, I almost wonder if he considered that in his calculus. Like, wait a second. I mean, obviously, you know, I've been with these Heat fans for 31 years now. Am I really going to leave them so they can be mad at me? Because I took a job with the Jets, the stinking Jets. Well, Jason Taylor went to the Jets and went into the That's Hall true. of Fame as a Dolphin. So it, it, it can uh, it can be done, obviously. And so... Uh, yeah, Eric trying to pump it up as if uh, as if Dolphin fans want Ryan Fitzpatrick to be good. I think he's missing the point. I, I, <laughs> I don't know that Dolphin fans want Ryan Fitzpatrick to be good. So check out that episode. Uh, Chris and I did an episode, Is Ryan Fitzpatrick Bad Enough for the Dolphins? Uh, we put that one up uh, yesterday. Also check out our episode with Marlins president, Mike Hill. There's a lot in there as we sort of gear up towards the season, the Marlins season. We'll have uh, an interview with JT Riddle, the starting shortstop for the Marlins coming up this week. All right, let's get right to it today, though. And I stayed up last night to watch the, all of the Oklahoma City game. And, you know, the Heat were, in my mind, very impressive. I, You know, I've been down on this team for most of the year. You know how I feel about it. They're still a, an under 500 team. I think there are things that if they had done them earlier in the season, they'd probably be plus 500 now. But I don't know that they were really sure if they wanted to win or not. And we're going to get into that also. But Look, they're in the playoff picture right now. They're in the eighth spot. They're actually only a game and a half as we speak right now behind the Nets. They're tied in the loss column. The Nets' schedule is brutal. We're going to go through some of the schedules. And and what I was impressive to me about last night, yes, I know there was no Russell Westbrook. I understand that completely, and that's worth quite a few points uh, in the calculus here. But what was impressive to me was you had kind of an emotional defensive performance against Charlotte. Then you have a six o'clock flight to Oklahoma City, and you get into Oklahoma City. You don't have Winslow again. You don't have Magruder. Not that he's a core piece, but he's kind of your tenth man. But you don't have Winslow, uh, who has been kind of running things for you lately. You get in there, you fall behind thirteen nothing, and then you're up before the first quarter is over, and then you sustain it. And, and so, to me, that's been one of my issues with this Heat team all year is that. They can have good moments, but they can't sustain it. And I want to put this in a broader context, Chris. They were able to sustain it last night. They get a good victory on the road. They score 116. Can they sustain the way they're playing overall? It's a good question uh, because if you actually look at the underlying numbers, they've had a good run. They've run. They've won eight of their last eleven uh, since Bam Adebayo has has returned into the or not returned, but has been inserted into the starting lineup. And I feel like he's going to kind of keep this role. But you look at it, and it really and it's one of the things that I thought would work for the Heat all year is that if we're talking all year about their depth being the, the the strong point of the team because they just have a bunch of, as you say, B-minus players, you know, 10, 11 guys that are really solid, then you would think that it's the guys that they can bring off the bench. And if you look at it, from a reputation and even from a resources standpoint, you look at the game last night against Oklahoma City, the, 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 the four that come off the bench are Goran Dragic, Dwayne Wade, James Johnson, and Hassan Whiteside. That's probably... $50 million worth of player, if not more. Uh, plus, you have, you know, a, you know Dwayne Wade, who's one of the greatest players of all time. And that's a lot of pedigree to bring off the bench. And last night, they hammered Oklahoma City coming off the bench when they're bringing on Abdel Nader and Markeith Morris and Raymond Felton. And they rightly beat up on a bench that just has nothing to it. And that's kind of what I thought the Heat would be all year. The starters are kind of a break-even proposition. But if you're a depth team, then you should be killing teams off the bench. And that's what they've kind of been doing in these last few games, and you've been trying to to nickname that, that that group of guys that are coming off the bench, and I, I think they've done a really good job of using their depth. And I think Eric Spolster's figured out a rotation, but 
I, I, I think ultimately, when you look at the big numbers, when you look at you know the net rating and things like that, they're a 500 team, and maybe they have slightly underperformed, and I think the coach deserves some blame for not figuring out the right combination of guys earlier on in the year. I think Eric Spolster deserves a bit of blame for that, but they've always, from a net rating standpoint, they haven't really drifted lower than minus one and a half at any point in the year. They've kind of been around a 500 team for me the whole of the year, and now in this crappy conference, the results are starting to reflect that. To me, the thing that I I draw a heart from is that uh, we're going to talk about the schedule as it relates to Brooklyn and as it relates to Detroit, but for Miami, I almost don't care about the schedule because they can summon a performance on the road against Oklahoma City, one of the best teams, and we've seen them lose any number of games to the bottom feeders in the Eastern Conference at home. So I I do think that this team on its night is capable of of summoning a performance as they did for a half against Milwaukee before getting destroyed the second half, as they did last night against Oklahoma City. They can go toe-to-toe with anyone, but as you said, not for four quarters. And, And that's the thing is sort of where I'm at right now with this Heat team is they're an average team. They're a 500 team. They're kind of what I expected to be ahead of the year when I was making 43 and 39 jokes. And now I think they've kind of gotten a model where they can have really solid stretches against almost anybody. Yeah, and like you mentioned, I mean, when you're losing so many games to Atlanta, but you're beating OKC and you're hanging with good teams, I I think you just get to the point where the team is impossible to predict. And, And so, you know, we've done seven or eight of these type of pods throughout the season. And I don't know that we understand them all that much better than we did before, but I do think the one thing that has changed is that I do think that Eric Spolster kind of fell into a workable rotation. I I don't know if I want to credit him for planning this. I I don't know. I I don't know if all along that they thought they would get to the three kids in the starting lineup. Um, I I don't know if I'd buy that completely. Um, I think it took the, the absence of Whiteside the absence of Dragic, you know, the sort of, uh, I don't know, the falling off a cliff of James Johnson, which is a topic I want to hit here too. Do you think injuries almost uh, provide cover for it? That basically yes. it, it's it's really hard to negotiate the relationships with these players if you're going to put them on the bench. Like, it's a really hard thing to do. As much as we could just say, we'll just do it. The, the, the kids are better. The kids deserve the opportunity to start. It's difficult when they're under contract for a long period of time to make that decision without the political ramifications in the locker room. So I do think that the injuries have provided cover for this. And as you said, I don't think Eric Spolster would have done this otherwise. Yeah, I don't know that he would have. I mean, look, they have three guys on their bench now who were starters on a team that was one game from the Eastern Conference Finals just three years ago. Like, I mean, that's it's a pretty remarkable turnaround. I mean, they basically just inverted the team. But it had to happen. And you mentioned Bam. You know, I'm watching him the last two games. I'm just focusing on him. I was sitting in the crowd um, on on Saturday at the home game. Excuse me, Sunday at the home game and then watching the game on TV last night. And just watching him play basketball is enjoyable. It is. He he Mm -hmm. moves without the ball. He passes. He he sees the next play. I'm not going to be critical of Hassan here. I think Hassan has, has exceeded expectations this year. But Bam, we've said it all along, is a modern big. He's a modern big. Yeah. And so you you look at, at the way that they play when he's on the floor, it's like you don't have to worry about him. Like with Hassan, there is always that concern. Like if you don't involve him, you don't get him to touches, he might zone out on you. Like with Bam, he just does stuff. And I can see why they didn't want to include him in packages. Is he going to become – Capella or Dwight or any I don't know I don't know but I just I see a certain uh, there's a confidence that he's playing with right now and I do think that's made a huge difference and I also look I went to Dwayne Wade's event on uh, on Saturday night his his uh, his fashion event um you know, run uh, you know night on run the runway Wade. yeah uh, I yeah runway yeah I, I I thought it was too it was interesting for a couple of reasons at first it was kind of cool the way it ended because it ended in the rain so all the models were in the rain but then I took a lot of this on our five reasons sports IG not particularly well, but I took it. Uh, but, you know, where we're, we're, they're playing one last dance, you know, they're playing, well, excuse me, last dance at the end for one last dance uh, with Dwayne and with Gabby and Justice is dancing. But he could dance, but he can't play with the thigh the last two games. But he was dancing there. Um, but basically, uh, you know, it was this sort of, you know, very joyous thing. But the one thing I noticed there is the kids are always together. <laughs> Always together. like at that event, like Bam and Josh were attached at the hip. Um, and it's just, and I, I gotta say, Hassan was to himself the whole night. Okay, and, and so I, I know it's it's just a snapshot, but these guys, these three guys, and Derek Jones Jr. is in there too, have kind of developed a relationship. And so I, I think putting them on the floor. I mean, we had when we had Derek Jones Jr. on the pod, he talked about how close they all are, how they 
root for each other. I feel like the fun that was missing this season, like this felt like drudgery with like, when are we going to get rid of these contracts? Like, I feel like just putting the three kids in the starting lineup, you know, and getting Derek Jones Jr. consistent minutes has given this team life. It looks like there's a future again I, for them, for the fans, for us as media. I, I think that's made a huge, huge difference. But a couple of things I want to touch on first. First, yes, we have named the bench. Uh, I put this to a poll and Flash Mob was the winner. Uh, it's a little bit of a... Uh, it's a little bit of a playoff of Dwayne Wade being on there. Um, the second thing is, and we're going to hit this in number two, is I don't know. I think their play may be somewhat sustainable in terms of playing at a higher level. Like I said, I don't know if it leads to wins or losses because they do go through these lulls. But I think the second part I want to get to here is, should Eric just leave it alone now? Because I don't think some guys are going to be happy long term with this. Like, it, it's fine when you're winning, Chris. Like, when yeah. you beat Charlotte and you win in Oklahoma City – and Goran gets all those minutes, and he looks terrific, and he's making six threes. But Ira asked Goran pretty point blank in the locker room. Goran doesn't Goran doesn't hide stuff. I mean, he he tells you the truth. And he asked him in the locker room after the game in Charlotte the other night. You know, he said, you know, how long are you okay with this? He said, well, I'm not healthy right. I'm not totally 100 percent healthy right now, so I'm okay with it for now. So I I do think with him, Dwayne has accepted it. Obviously, I mean, I would like to see Dwayne get one start before the end of the season at home, that Philadelphia game. He can get introduced last, I, it, it, particularly if the game doesn't mean anything. Um, I think that would be kind of cool. But I, I feel like Hassan has kind of accepted it. I, I don't know if Goran's completely accepted it. If you're Eric, do you just leave it be? Um, yeah, I, 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 I think you do. And it's difficult, as I said, because, you know, the guys that are paid the big money want to start. Uh, I do think that there's a spot for Goran in the starting lineup, and that would probably be the Dion Waiters spot. Um, now, I, again, Dion is probably a player that wants to start, but I don't know if he can really uh, stake that claim with any kind of conviction because he's not playing particularly well. Um, but but I, I do think that you can find room for Goran Dragic in this starting lineup. Again, if you think that the starting lineup is an important thing, which for NBA players it is. Like, like We just have to acknowledge that Goran Dragic is a player uh, that was going to want to start. He's on the money of a, of a player who'd want to start. And he certainly, in the Oklahoma City game, puts in the performance of a player that deserves to start, makes six threes and scores 26 points in a win on the road at, at OKC. He's going to start to feel like, all right, I'm back. Can I be put in the starting lineup now? And, and that is again the difficulty of having 10 players that feel like they should be playing and you know in the case of you know Magruder and Derek Jones Jr. you know you get up to 10 11 players that feel like they should be playing but I, I, at the same time I, I'm looking at the, the overall rotation and I'm kind of wondering if these are sort of decisions that are made that are meant to try and encourage players uh, to maybe want something else so I think the two most difficult ones to figure out in terms of getting off of are James Johnson and then uh, Deion Waiters goes without saying. I, I actually wonder if there's a trade on for them uh, and the Cleveland Cavaliers in the summer. I heard Bill Simmons mention this trade, uh, but basically you take your pick that's going to end up being 15th in the lottery and you know attach it to James Johnson and trade him for the for the expiring contract of J.R. Smith that you can waive for three million dollars and, and and you get off some money. I also wonder as well if maybe putting us on Whiteside and Goran Dragon on the bench encourages them to maybe opt out so you have salary cap space entering the offseason uh, these kinds of moves that again we're looking for the light at the end of this tunnel and as you mentioned as you mentioned one of the aspects of this is the kids playing and the young guys starting to form a core of a decent team and and you kind of wonder where you can kick on from there and then uh, the other aspect of it is maybe taking a player like Goran Dragic or Hassan Whiteside and not encouraging them to opt out but maybe saying we would be okay if you opted out by putting them on the bench and then trying to figure out those next couple moves that get you to that place so I, I do kind of wonder what the ulterior motives are but in terms of the near term I mean you've you're winning games this way and I think Eric Spolster has a credible argument to say hey you know I I've, I I can you know negotiate this position of we're we've won eight of our last 11 we're playing well why am I going to change things and and as you said this is easy to do while you're winning, and maybe the next time they lose three in a row, that change is going to have to be made. But for now, I don't think you can make. I don't think you can make the changes, and I think you can pretty well sell it to the players on the team that are maybe that maybe have reduced roles right now because you're winning, and that is the ultimate. That is the ultimate trump card in trying to figure out, you know, how to sell this to players that are expecting more of their roles. Yeah, and I think the only move you can make at this point is the one you mentioned. Um, and it, by the way, it is a move I would make in the playoffs. Um, I, I would I would put Dragic in the starting lineup uh, for Dion, and if you're going to do that, 
you need to do it soon uh, because I, I, you, you need to get Dragic and Winslow playing together. I, I think when Justice comes back, you look at making – Eric likes to make changes together a lot of the time. I think once Justice is back, I think you put Goran in the starting lineup for Dion. And I, I understand that you may lose Dion. I get it. Um, but I, he hasn't really been playable lately, right? I mean, I, I know you're winning, but it's like you're winning because you're yanking him off the floor. And, and I know that people are going to say, well, you're being unfair to Dion when Josh Richardson has made, what, 18% of his shots in the last two games. But, like, Josh provides other things. I, I just, you know, and I think he'll snap his way out of it. And I do think with Josh, there seems to be some correlation when Justice doesn't play. Um, I was trying to look into the numbers on that yesterday, but – I feel like Josh feel now that Justice has kind of become the alpha of the two. I feel like Josh kind of is expected to move more into that alpha role again. And as we've talked about, he's a mash burner and Eddie Jones. He's not a Tim Hardaway in that regard. Um, I think Justice is more Tim Hardaway. And so I, I you know, I, I think Josh will be fine when Justice is back. But I do think that you need to get some reps with Goron and Justice playing together because. Aren't you going to close with that a lot, even if you don't start with it? Sure. Right. I mean, I you right. I mean, so so what? Okay. So let's say let's say let's say they keep the starting lineup the same. Okay. Let's say that you know Linux stays in there. He had a couple of off games, but he's better last night. Let's say he stays in there. Uh, you got James Johnson now, I, oddly refreshed. I don't know if I want to buy into it yet because we've we've been head faked by him before, but he dunked on consecutive possessions. What's the last time he's done that? Um, <laughs> I, so I, 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 I do think I, I do think this run out of the team and all. Also, coming off the bench, because that's one of the things that I've, I've just kind of understood now about NBA basketball is that players like certain roles. And you remember in right. that in that stretch run in 2016, James Johnson was coming off the bench and really good at it. So he might just be a player that even if he's playing 33 minutes, as long as he's coming off the bench, he's, he's figured out how to get his body to work in that period of time. So I, I'm I'm not entirely ruling out that James Johnson off the bench could be a thing that works for them. Yeah, well, and it works. It's worked two straight games. And, you know, after not playing 11, it's also possible that he, they just haven't been honest about his health mm. and may, may Maybe just getting the 11 games off uh, will rejuvenate him in some regard. I mean, he's, he's moving better. It's, it's not just that he's playing better. He's moving better. He looks more like the guy from two years ago. So I maybe, like you say, maybe it is somewhat of a, you know, a, you know, a role thing and understanding his role, but I, it looks like a physical thing to me too. So, you know, we've seen that with Hassan at times also, right? Hassan gets some time off and comes back and looks different. I, I feel like a little of that time with James Johnson. But let's say they keep the starting line the same. Let's say that they leave Goran off the bench. Who's your closing five in most games? Uh, okay, so you start with Winslow and Richardson. Uh, you probably throw uh, Dwayne Wade in there. We're talking about closing. Um, yeah. Then, then you're... yeah, I, I think I think you start with him. Let's let's start with him. Okay, sure. And work back. He's uh, he's closing in his final season. Chris. Right. Yeah. Even if, even if yes. He's... Yes. I, I mean, particularly in playoff okay. games. I mean, I mean, I I talk all the time about, or, or I I really love the, the the phrase that Draymond Green threw out of sixteen game players versus eighty two game players. There might not be a player on this roster that is more that than Dwayne Wade. Uh, yeah. So uh, Wade, Winslow, Richardson, and then you're kind of. Figure, I, I would I would figure I would close that out with uh, Dragic and Olynyk uh, because I think Kelly Olynyk is is just a player that helps them win whenever he is on the floor. Yeah. Particularly when you're looking at this recent stretch of, of of victories, this 11 game stretch, and you don't want to overstate it. But first off, they've clearly blown through uh, this minutes restriction that he was going to be on for this performance bonus. It seems like he's going to hit that performance bonus because you know, he's playing 36 minutes against OKC. He's playing 35. But, but minutes. You, you know what? You know why they've blown through it, Chris? You know because he helps because him win. They, they think got, no, no, no. Well, yeah, but there's the other part of it. Remember, it's a two-part thing here. It's it's a it's a certain number of minutes, and it's making the playoffs. That's when the clause kicks in. And so I think that at a certain point here, they've realized, okay, we're probably going to make the playoffs. Like, the, I mean, they're and so and Kelly's going to help us do that. But there's no point in suppressing his minutes now because once he makes the playoffs, he gets he gets the money anyway. And mm-hmm. so so that's. So, so I, I think this was a calculus. I think it's unfortunate, frankly, uh, that they did this, okay, and that they held him to 16 minutes a game in January, because if they had, with three DNPs, because if they hadn't done that, they'd be in the sixth spot right now, okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't think there's any. I mean, playing James Johnson, James Johnson was until this recent stretch of two games. Was, is a minus six for 100 possessions. Kelly's a plus three. I mean, just do the numbers on that. Like, I mean, you're you're not going to be on the top five, but you would have been the sixth seed right now. So I think at this point, it's just, yeah, just let it go. 
And if you look at this recent period that I'm talking about, 11 games, he's a plus 12 in that run of games. He helps them win. So I think I think he's got to be in any combination of five. He just makes the thing work and even d- is defending well enough. He's one of the better defenders right now on the team, or at least the team defends well when he's on the floor. So I, I think he's got to be in that lineup along with Dragic. So, so mine would be Dragic, Wade, uh, Winslow, Richardson, and Olenek would be my five. Are you too small? Because that would be my five also. And, I, you know, I think you can look – you know the, you know who the six would be for me? Derek Jones Jr. Because no, of the for, flexibility for me the, he for me the, in terms the, of his the, lane. The, for me, the six would be Bam with Olenek. Uh, and you're I, no, I think I think I, you're flipping Bam and Dragic. No, I th- I think you probably would have to take. I think you'd probably have to take Bam out at that point. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, I guess Bam Bam and Olenek works well, and as you said, would probably bring you that size. But I don't know. I think you're you're right. It is probably hard to get all all four of those guards. It would it would depend on the matchup, right? I mean, if you're playing Philly, you can't do that because you get torched defensively uh, from a size point of view. But I, I think mm-hmm. depending on the team, you probably could figure out a way to get those four guys. But of of the four smaller players, man, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't I, I'm I've not been particularly impressed with the way that Jay Rich has been playing recently, so I might be inclined right. I might be inclined to take him off the floor and have Dragic, Winslow, and Wade uh be be your three kind of small guys with Bam and Olenek on the floor. And it's for me it's it's totally matchup dependent, but I think right now your 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 best five in terms of what you're going down the stretch with would be some combination of Dragic, Wade, Winslow, Richardson, and Olenek, but I think depending on the matchup you're gonna have to make those changes. But here's where we are. This is remarkable. Because a year ago, before the Phillies series, and even earlier this season, if I had asked you for your five, you would not have had Winslow as a definite. You just wouldn't. No. Right? No, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I will say right? that I, 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 did, I did say that he was a 16-game – like, like I, I thought in the playoffs last year, despite his numbers being bad, I thought he was really good in the playoffs. And, and I, I do kind of wonder how, how we should sort of discuss about, you know, last year in the, play, in the playoffs – only for me, Wade and Winslow were players that looked like they belonged on a playoff stage. I think just about everyone else uh, ca- came up short in that area, and I kind of wonder in a year's time how much that would have changed or, or who you can develop any new confidence in, but I'm still kind of operating under that assumption. I think Winslow, particularly now with his improved play, and the funny thing is that we're, you know, I'm talking about this run of games, is that he's actually been a far greater if, influence on offense than he has been on defense. Uh, it's a, one t- a 117 with him off, uh, on, on the floor offensively, but a 110 defensively with him on the floor compared to 97.9 when he's off the floor. So it's actually offensively that he's impacting things the most right now, but I think he's him and Wade right now are the only players to me that I trust in a playoff setting. So I, I, I would have said a year ago that I trust Winslow in a playoff setting, but I would not have trusted him to do what he's done recently. I think this this has been a really surprising development for me. For, for me, and I, I really I, I should make I've made a couple on Twitter, but I should make a couple on the podcast that I've been very wrong about Justice Winslow. And frankly, I've also been, I've also felt bad about how strongly I've said things about Justice Winslow after hearing him talk about mental health. And and I don't think that's necessarily an about face. I, I I really do think that when he says, well, when people say that I'm worthless, I kind of feel worthless, then you know, I really should reconsider the way that I talk about these things. But I, I, I do think that his emergence is something that I wouldn't have expected. Even for a player so young, I just think with the number of games and number of years he'd been in the league, it would have been hard for me to foresee quite such a turnaround. But he's pulled it off, and offensively, you know, trust his three-point shot, you know, trust his finishing at the rim, and he's doing all those extra things that I think people have seen in him for years, certainly, or guys in Miami Heat beat have seen for years. So yeah, I, I I viewed him as a as a playoff prospect a year ago, but not as a heavy contributor that I think I do now. All right, so a couple of things on that. One, your Mia culpa has been recorded and will be played on Miami Heat beat. So just so we're clear on that. Uh, number two, we, we were looking for ways to pad this episode. We're going to play Justice better in its totality. Oh no! At the very end of this episode, <laughs> yes, we are before my before my daughter signs off. You, you realize I have to get her to sign off every time. That's not a recording. right. No, every no. Time it's every, to, every time you got to put I, the I, phone next to your next to your daughter so she can say thank you for listening. Right, I have to call to her five reasons podcast. At, at her at her, at her Mandarin class or what? I have to call her and she, and she does uh, she does that. But yeah, we're gonna have to play Justice better at some point here. And by the way, he did ask me at Dwayne's event for more T-shirts. So if you're looking for Justice better T-shirts, uh, Miami Heat beat has them. Justice has them. Derek Jones Jr. has them. Uh, Bam has them, and Josh has them. Unfortunately, though, if, if Josh has worn them lately, Justice has looked better than Josh. So we, we need to do a Josh <laughs> better T-shirt to get, to get Josh. And and, and, and by the way, uh, if you if you want to buy the shirts for yourself, it is Miami Heat Beat dot store. Miami Heat Beat dot store. If you want to buy uh, your Justice Winslow shirt today. Uh, but yeah, look, I, I mean, I think Justice 
analysis is given at this point. And I think the, the question is, you know, who do you want play, playing with who? Some of it's matchup based, but some of it is just players that connect. The problem is, it's like when I talk about moving Goran to the starting lineup because you need to get him reps with Winslow, you know, we've kind of figured out the, the Dwayne Goran thing, which was the big issue three years ago, right? Like I wrote a million stories about that. Goran and Dwayne don't play well together. What's happening lately? Gordon and Dwayne are playing really well together. Um, yeah. So that's like the one you don't worry about. But the problem is, I don't know who Dion plays well with because Dion played really well with Goron two years ago. And so, but you can't really put the two of them together, right? Unless you put Dwayne in the starting lineup and you're not going to do that. So I guess for now you leave it alone, but I do think you need to look at the idea of just taking Dion out of the rotation if he's not effective. I, I He's... He, he, you know, there are just games he's going to shoot you out of them. And I'm going to look at some of his numbers here, okay, because I mean, he's still the one, right? I mean, Tyler's gone, okay, so nobody's beating on him anymore. Mm-hmm. James Johnson, who's been kind of the guy I've beaten on the most, is playing better. Um, you know, then, like, let me, let me look at some of, uh, some, of, some of Dion's numbers. I mean, I guess he's been okay. I mean, he's, he's six points, three of eight shooting against OKC. Charlotte, he had 12 points on 40%. Milwaukee, 10 points on 40%. I mean, he's shooting 40.7% for the season. He's a career 41.2% shooter. I mean, he's basically, I hate to say it because I know that he expected more. He's basically been what he is. Right. I mean, yeah. injury or no injury, wanting to play more. I mean, it's just, you know, they rewarded someone who, you know, this is what he is. I mean, I'm looking back, did have 15 against Toronto on six of 10, uh, was okay against Detroit, five of 12 for 14. I mean, he's had some okay performances in here, but I mean, clearly this team gets more dynamic when Goran gets on the floor. I, I, right? I will, so I will, I will how, say, though, so again, I'm, I'm looking at last 11 games. I like kind of looking at flashpoints in the year. Um, in the last 11 games, he has been part of, uh, Waiters has, the three best four-man lineups. Now, I, I, I think the, 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 the five-man lineup will kind of bear this out, too. But the four-man lineup all include uh, Dion Waiters. I mean, you look at you know, specific combinations. Uh, by the way, the, the best five is because he starts – uh, with Olenek, Winslow, Richardson, and Bam, they're a plus 42 together. So I, that, that, is, mm. th- that is a lineup that has worked together. But, I mean, you look at th- these sort of micro combinations. I mean, you're right, though, about Waiters you know, struggling with these guards. The players that he's best with are, are these kind of fellow starters that seem to make sense with his game. But as you kind of go down, it, it doesn't quite work the same. The, the, for me, the one player that is, I think, if we're, if we're talking about combinations and lineups, a player that, no, that fits with no matter who, uh, for me, it's, it's Kelly Olynyk. Uh, you look at, you know, recently mm-hmm. uh, with Richardson, he's a plus 71 in 11 games. With Wade, he's a plus 54. And even on the year, uh, the two best lineup combinations are him with Richardson and him with Winslow, plus 147 and plus 124. I mean, that, he's just a player that works well with everyone. Offensively, he, he, he does a great job of keeping the flow and offense going and defensively is strong enough to kind of hold up in the interior and even when he gets stretched out. So I, I think Olenek is the one player that kind of makes – and I think can kind of account for some of the clunkier fits in other places like as you've talked all year long about the the fit with waiters and wade i think if you have him out there with olenic there's some things that are aided by the fact that olenic is a threat to shoot from the outside is a threat to create as well and and i think just kind of makes that makes these clunky fits in other areas of the team work really well yeah which is again why it's sort of a shame that they were holding down his minutes because, yeah. <laughs> because I, because I mean, you look at some of the problems in January and I think some of them could have been alleviated and there's really never been a good reason given for that other than the one we think it is. And so I, you know, that's unfortunate. Let's get to the playoff picture here as we're speaking. I misspoke a little bit earlier. Uh, the Heat are actually just one game behind the Nets now. So they're, they're one game behind the Nets tied in the loss column. So basically the, the top five seeds are gone, right? So, I mean, it's, it's going to be some combination. The Bucks are probably going to finish first. Uh, the Raptors second. The Sixers, Pacers, and Celtics are separated by two and a half games. The Pacers have been remarkable to me, although they've lost a couple straight as we're speaking. And then you get to six through ten. Okay, now I think that the Heat kind of ended the Hornets the other night or the other day. Uh, the Hornets are now two, two and, and a half, half back. back of the eight. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's just Kemba. I mean, there's just nothing else on that team right now. Batum is not dynamic anymore uh, since he got the money. They're playing Kaminsky heavy minutes. I, I don't I don't see it. So basically, let, let's look at six through nine. You've got the Pistons, 36 and 34. The Heat hammered them recently. The Nets, the Heat hammered them recently, uh, 36 and 36. The Heat are 34 and 36, two games behind the Pistons, one behind the Nets. One game ahead of the Magic, 33 and 38. They've won a couple straight. 
I'm going to ask you right now, before we sort of dive really deeply into the schedule here, um, what's the best of those four teams? I, I, think, I think it's the same as it is by record. I think it's Detroit. I think um, just uh, for me, as, as simple of analysis as this is, having Blake Griffin as the best player in that bunch is such a you know tiebreaker for me. I think just having the one player that is that central figure that you know going down the stretch of a game, he's the player that you're trusting. He's been the fulcrum of an offense and has kind of made that thing work when they don't have a great deal of talent and hell they they just lost to Cleveland. I mean they're 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 not a great team, but having that great player makes such a massive difference. And by the way, in that Cleveland game, Blake didn't play, so I, th- I think you can see how important he is to that team. I mean Wayne Ellington at 25 in that game, my God, but I mean I. I think Blake Griffin is having one of the best seasons of his career, and the fact that they have a frontline player that the other teams just don't have, I think makes the world of difference. I think looking at what he's done from a creation standpoint in terms of getting assists to his guys and being the leading scorer, I think I think Blake Griffin right now is the sole reason why I'd pick Detroit over any of those other four teams if you include Orlando. Well, he's clearly the best player on those four teams. There's no question about that. I mean, Vucevic is good. Uh, Gordon's good. You know, obviously the Heat don't have that guy at this point um brooklyn doesn't have well i guess they have d'angelo so i you know maybe he is that guy uh, i do think when i look at brooklyn though uh, i think it's starting to catch up on them a little bit you know they, they they've gone through some injuries to their guards throughout the year which put a burden on other guys and I, you know it's a young team um but they've never really been through this before i don't know that there was a big expectation that they would be here um, I'm looking at it right now, though. When I look at the schedule, the net schedule is outrageous. Uh, I mean, you have, you ha- I mean, it is. It's it's not it's not just playoff teams. It's playoff teams on the road, and it's the upper echelon playoff teams that they're facing. You know, they've lost three in a row. I mean, I could easily see, see them with their schedule. They're 36 and 36. You know, right now. So you're talking about 10 games left. Three and seven, maybe. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe they're if, 39, 39 and 43. If if they're if they're going to make the playoff, I mean, I, I, that sounds extreme, right? Because Brooklyn has kind of been firmly entrenched in the playoff positions for a while. But if they're going to make it, I mean, they've got to win in Sacramento and in Los Angeles and beat the Lakers. Now you kind of look at those logos in the schedule, like, oh, it's LeBron, oh, it's Sacramento. But I mean, Sacramento has fallen way off the pace in the Western Conference. They're definitely not making it. The Lakers definitely aren't making it and are probably tanking right now. So I, I think I think Brooklyn is is going to have to win these next two games, but you're right, man. I mean, the way that they close is ludicrous. At Portland, yep. at Philly, home Boston, home Milwaukee, home Toronto, at Milwaukee, at Indiana. I mean, that stretch of seven games are as difficult as it gets in the NBA before closing against Miami. And who knows if that has major seating implications that final day of the year at Barclays Center. But, I mean, my God, what a difficult schedule to go down the stretch with. So, yeah, I mean, Miami can reasonably work their way into seven. I mean, I don't know if you feel any better about a Toronto matchup than you do about a Milwaukee matchup. But, I mean, Miami can move up in the standings a little bit here. Uh, They have some opportunities. I don't know if they can catch Detroit with so few games left. I mean, looking at Miami's schedule, um, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're on a little bit of a difficult road trip right now, despite the fact they won in Oklahoma City. They're in San Antonio, have won nine in a row, including being the Warriors last night. They're in Milwaukee. Um, they're home with Orlando, which, as we know, is the most difficult game on the schedule. Um, they have a home and home with Boston. Uh, they're in Toronto. Uh, they're they're home with Philly. You know, uh, going down the stretch, so some difficult games for them as well. But I, I think Miami definitely has a chance to get to seven. Just looking at the schedule for Brooklyn, and then Detroit might just be that step too far. But I mean, it's not like we're saying that Detroit's an amazing team, but uh, and, and they're, they're on a little bit of a West Coast swing right now. They're, uh, after they play at Phoenix, uh, they're at Portland, at Golden State, and at Denver. So they, they've, I mean, it's not like they've got an easy schedule either. So I, I think Miami can, can maybe get up to six, but I think the more likely scenario is they end, they end the season at seven. Yeah, I think they probably end at seven, although I could see them get to six. Like you said, it's just tough to go through the schedule because, like you say, the Orlando game at home looks more challenging to me than the Milwaukee game on the road uh, with this <laughs> team. So it's just, it's just sorry to tell. By the way, you mentioned the Spurs. How are they doing this again? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just, I mean, not, they're, they're tied with the Thunder. They're ahead of them, the tiebreaker now for the five spot, and they're right behind the Blazers. They may end up with a home court seed in the Western Conference, which is, is ridiculous. I, I do think that he'd probably end up seventh. Um, you know, I've given up on my whole thing about them not making the playoffs. Uh, they're going to make the playoffs. I think the tanking crew needs to get over it. Uh, it, it they're going to make They haven't come this far to not make it. I, I just think, you know, they have enough pieces working well at this point. But, yeah, the schedule is, I mean, it is somewhat challenging. Uh, just, again, if you're looking at it normally, you say at Spurs is a loss, at Bucks is a loss, at Wizards 
should be a win. The Heat have weird performances against the Wizards, um, but they're out of it now. Uh, Magic at home should be a win. The Heat have weird performances <laughs> against the against the Magic. <laughs> Uh, the Mavericks at home are out of it now. I, I, and I mean, and Dallas, gonna, Dallas I is a terrible team on the road. They are on the year. Uh, away from they're 6-28 and 28 away from home this year. Right. So that you figure that's a win at New York has to be a win, um, you know, although it wasn't for LeBron. Uh, at, at Boston, probably a loss, NBA TV game. Then Boston at home, I guess you got to try to split those. Timberwolves on the road, the Jimmy Butler battle. The end, the Wolves will be out of it. And the Raptors – probably aren't going to need that last one. Um, I don't think, right? I mean, I, th- I wouldn't anticipate because by then I think they'll probably be out of it. And then yeah, they're, 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 they're two and a half, they're, the they're, game the they're two and a half back in Milwaukee and they're three and a half ahead of Philly. So they're pretty well locked into that, to that second scene, unless Milwaukee goes on a little bit of a tailspin here. And, and that might be the first round opponent. So let's go to that here in number four. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. I mean, obviously the Heat saw Philadelphia last year. You've got Milwaukee who we saw kind of, the full breadth of their power the other night when they're down yeah. 20 and then they're up 20 by the time you wake up from a nap. And I can speak to that personally. Um, <laughs> and then Toronto, I'm, I, I, and then, and then Toronto, you know, uh, you kind of know what the Raptors are at this stage, obviously trying to keep Kawhi and you know, that should make them a little bit different in the playoffs. I don't think that you're going to see Indiana. Um, they'd have to get to six and Indiana would have to claim three. I, I, I don't see it. So but let's just look at the other teams, the other, the other possibilities um, of those. Uh, we've done this before, but looking at the Heat now, who do they match up best against? I would say right now injuries play a massive role in this because uh, we saw um, Kyle Lowry is, is, is being looked at. Malcolm Brogdon has a serious injury that's probably at least going to keep him out for a first-round playoff series. And it's kind of it's weird. You have the uh, – I, I still have the NBA insiders on notifications on my phone uh, j- you, you know, because, like, during the trade deadline, that's, like, the number one thing you want. It's just, like, everyone all the time, you know, give me the latest morsel of information. And now those tweets are kind of all filled with, oh, so-and-so is seeking a medical opinion about this knee injury. And the latest was Kyle Lowry, uh, although Woj said that, that he didn't think it was that serious. But again, I mean, injuries are the kind of things that can play a role. And Milwaukee, Sands Malcolm Brogdon is still a really good team, but it's not the same team. And so I, I do kind of wonder if there's any advantageous matchups to take advantage of there. But I think Milwaukee is too strong. They've got too much of just a solid foundation defensively and particularly offensively. I mean, right now, they're, they're, they're close to averaging 118 points a game. They have the same scoring average as the Golden State Warriors and, and are a little bit better better defensively too. I mean, from a net rating standpoint, uh, they're fantastic. Uh, they're a plus 8.8, uh, you know, 113 offensive rating for the year. Um, like they've got all the things you want, but again, those little things can be the difference. I, I, I don't think Miami stands a chance to beat either of those two teams, but I, I will say I, I thought that pursuing an eight seed or pursuing one of the, you know, one of these lower seeds in the Eastern Conference was going to be a fruitless endeavor. I do think that even though the Heat are going to eventually lose to one of these two teams, I don't think they're going to get hammered. I don't think it's going to be like, you know, four losses of 20 plus points and you're, you're never going to feel you're like you're going to go into one of those games leading by nine at the half and feeling excited about it. Like, I think these will be fun playoff series, even if they're short. And so I, I to me, I, I would right now would rather play Milwaukee because of this Brogdon injury. And I think Lowry will be fine for the postseason and Kawhi is going to play every game. Uh, so I, I, I don't think, I don't think I want any part of Toronto, but I would probably say Milwaukee just based off of not really having done it in the postseason. Um, and the fact that they're dealing with a little bit of injuries right now. You know, I always look at the combustibility factor, like what team could blow up if they lose a game early in a series at home. And to me, that team is Boston. Uh, I, you know, it could be Philly too. Mm-hmm. And obviously with Toronto, some of those Toronto always loses the first game of the playoff series. So I, uh, you know, maybe it's them, but I'm going to go with Boston. I mean, it hasn't been right all year. Um, you've got, we've talked about this many times, this idea that the young players kind of led them in the playoffs last year and they've been pushed to the back burner. I understand what Kyrie can be. I also understand that Kyrie can sprain something at any time. I, I don't know that the heat beat the Celtics. But the Heat play competitively against the Celtics, typically. And I think that they would get up for that. Um, the environment would be such that they would get up for that. If they could steal one of the first two, I think they can make it a series. I don't see the Heat winning a playoff series uh, this year. But I, to me, that's the one team. I, something It's just still not right. I, and I don't know that it gets right. Maybe you know, there's been certain teams. I go back to like the 1999 Knicks. Okay? Now, they need to lose somebody. Ewing went out. Okay, That's where the whole Ewing theory started to get to the finals. 
But something was kind of wrong with that team the whole year. And then it just sort of, once it found it, it started to roll. The 2006 Heat were a little bit like that. These Celtics are talented enough to be that, but they're also talented. They're also screwed up enough to go out, out in the first round. Yeah. And so I, that's the kind of team I think that the Heat needs to play in the first round. I just think Milwaukee is going to clinically beat them down. I just think that the, the, their depth, uh, their length, their shooting, I understand Brogdon uh, being out is a big thing for them. Uh, but overall, you know, Brooke Lopez's ability to spread the floor, I do think he can stay on the floor against the Heat. I think there are certain teams he can't, but he, he can against Miami. I think he can against Bam. He can against the Linux. He can against Whiteside. The Heat are always going to play one of those three bigs. So I just think I, I think Milwaukee is going to be too difficult for them to deal with. Um, it'd be emotional for Dwayne, obviously, as all of these will be, but especially because that's where he played his college ball. But but I think Boston is, is the one. All right, let's pivot to somebody who's not going to be in the playoffs. I tweeted this yesterday. Um, LeBron James would have been a lot happier if he hadn't left Miami. And, of course, it, you know, we've got 1,200 retweets, and also we've got a bunch of angry Laker fans and mostly angry Cavs fans who were saying that there's one title in Cleveland – means more than his two in Miami, and I don't want to sort of rehash that. I just want to look at where he is right now, (laughs) okay? And he's there right now because he couldn't stand Dan Gilbert anymore. That's part of it, right? Part of it was the opportunities in Los Angeles and the -the off-the-court stuff and everything else and his family, but part of it is he couldn't simply not stand uh, Dan Gilbert anymore. So he's in Los Angeles. He's not going to make the playoffs. It's not just he's not going to make the playoffs. He's being embarrassed, (laughs) Like. In a way, he's never never been embarrassed, and he's putting up numbers. So it's like it's not like he's not playing at a high level, but he's getting his shot blocked by Hazonia at the end of a game and missing <laughs> 13 shots or whatever it was in the fourth quarter. I mean, and they're not even close to a playoff spot. Like we were talking at the All Star break, you and I did this one. They were two and a half back. They're they're te- they're nine and a half back of the Clippers, who traded their best player. It's who traded their best player. Uh, I mean, it's how how did first thing. How did this happen? Um, And and second thing, I I know you have something you want to say about LeBron's decision since he left the Heat. Yeah, so uh, to me, the thing that's uh, kind of the most offensive thing about all this is that LeBron James, best basketball player, you know, of my lifetime, uh, best basketball. I I think a lot of people would like when when people still say, well, who do you want? Right. People would still pick LeBron as the guy that for this season, for this pub, for this postseason, that's the number one guy that you would want. He is that level of talent. And he took himself out of the running to win the championship to go and pursue off-court opportunities. That is what happened here. Because, and look, the Los Angeles Lakers deserve a massive amount of blame for kind of for haggling over their their asking price for Anthony Davis, for haggling over their asking price for Kawhi Leonard, for not wanting to pursue Paul George because they thought they could have gotten him in free agency anyway. I mean, they've screwed up the ability to get LeBron James a running mate. And then they make this, you know, these horrific decisions of bringing in Stevenson and and Contavious Caldwell Pope and JaVale and Michael Beasley and all these guys that didn't work. And they don't seem to have any idea of the kind of players to put around LeBron. And frankly, I also think, because I think LeBron was involved in that decision making, because I don't think anything happens without LeBron's, you know, at worst tacit approval and at most clear approval. I, I like... He, I don't think he understands what he wants, what he needs to run with. I think if you've kind of thrown some of the teammates and when they start with him, he's like, I don't know about this guy. And then by the end, he ends up loving playing with them. Like, I think he kind of had this idea of what he wanted to play with to maybe lessen his burden. Because like before the year, they're talking about post touches and playmaking outside of LeBron when that's the exact opposite of what you want to do. I think he was kind of tired of the I'm going to create and everyone else is going to shoot model that has been put around him. But for me... He made a decision to not want to win. Just as for me in Cleveland, he kind of did the same thing. Now he's kind of looking at it going, well, Kyrie is on the is on the come up, and we can trade, you know, Andrew Wiggins and and a couple of other pieces to go and Kevin Love, and we'll start from there. But coach, organization, owner, not the kind of infrastructure you need to win. He was looking for a narrative play to get people to like him again, and maybe I'll win this championship. And if Draymond Green doesn't kick people in the nuts, he's probably 0 for 4 in terms of championships. So this begs me two questions. Number one, is he interested at all in winning, or is he just interested in creating a narrative around himself? And that, for me, is so shocking. When you look, I mean, just the, what was the, for me, the main opportunity for him in free agency, and they kind of got this very nice, meeting not even with LeBron and even with Rich Paul but someone in LeBron's camp 
the obvious place for him to go now in retrospect was Philly because Philly had Simmons and Embiid. They had the the, the free agent mm. cap space to go and win Someone now. Someone said this. Well, yeah, Someone I mean, said this. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about I mean, we talked about it all summer. Philly was the place for him to go and win. But can we say now that LeBron James's first priority is not winning? And look, it doesn't have to be. But, uh, but I do think that he deserves real criticism for picking the situation that is kind of – and his family's involved and all that stuff. But at the same time, you've got a finite number of, uh, of years, right? Yeah, LeBron James has kind of seemed impervious to age. He's got a finite number of years. He needed to pick the situation that would help him win. And I don't think a lot of people would have looked at LeBron James going to Philly and went – Oh well, he's taking the easy way out, like like we did with Kevin Durant, or even like we did with him the first time in Miami. But like to me, that he didn't pick the one that was most likely to help him win. If he goes to Philly, they're probably the one seed, and they have a real chance to knock off Golden State in the finals. Like that for me is an egregious decision that he's now playing with a team that is eight games under five hundred, and it begs the second question, which is: Has LeBron been coasting on the fact that he's played his, he's played his entire career in the Eastern Conference? And for me, the answer is yes. You're nine and a half. You're nine and a half games back. Not of some juggernaut great team, as you said, the Clippers. That traded their best player. That you look at their roster and you're like, there's no stars here. There aren't any great players on that Clippers team. And they're still nine and a half games back. I'm under the impression now that LeBron James, whose Lakers team this year is 21 and 23 against the Western Conference, that he's been coasting on playing in the in the junior varsity conference for 15 years. And that if he had been playing in the difficult conference for the last eight, he would not be on a run of eight straight finals. Hell, he might not be, he might not even be on a, a run of one straight finals that he's been getting away with playing in the Eastern Conference, and it is making me question things. As much as LeBron is kind of this impervious, unimpeachable figure, these results are making me question a lot of things about his motives and his actual performances that he's put in in his last few years. He's obviously been incredible, but he's kind of been doing it the easy way. And the first time he goes and do it the difficult way, it's been a spectacular failure. And I think that I think people take it easy on him because you know he's he's kind of gone from... 2010, where everyone hated him, to now he's kind of this unimpeachable figure. I, I think what's happened in this last year, he deserves real criticism for what's happened. I think he made a terrible decision in the off season, and the Lakers have totally failed him as well. Yeah, I think it, it plays both ways. And uh, look, I, I don't know if it takes away from what he did in the East, but I will say this: it's, it's funny he left the East. Now the East is the most competitive at the top that it's ever been. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if he saw this coming, actually. Uh, you know, because you know, with Toronto and and you know, you didn't know. I, now he signed with the Lakers before they traded for Kawhi, correct? Or uh, no? Yes, I, I, I think so. Wait, I, I, okay, I'll, so, I'll, I'll look it up here. Hold on. Okay, I'm not, I'm not quite clear on that one. But obviously he knew Boston was, was improving. He knew Giannis was an emerging force. Um, and Indiana looked with Oladipo before the season looked, you know, like they had a, a legitimate chance. I mean, they've been much better than I expected without Victor, but – but they've still been pretty damn good. Uh, so, you know, the East is better than it was, and he did leave the East for the West, which has been good, but not as good as it's been, right? Like, we talk about San Antonio. They're in, they're tied for the five spot right now. It's not a great Spurs team, you know, as compared to previous ones. The Blazers are in a home court seed situation. That's not a great team. They have two very good players, one of whom is hurt right now. So I, I'm with you a little bit on that. I don't know that I want to take away from anything on this. I just think... To me, the big story here is the way it's not being covered. Mm. Uh, like, I was in the middle of nine and eight in 2010, 2011, and you would have thought that like LeBron had like, I, I, I mean, you know, set off a nuclear bomb. Like, I, you know, like <laughs> with, with the reaction to him, you know, I was in Cleveland for 19 and 20. It wasn't as bad as nine and eight because everybody hated Miami and loved the Cleveland storyline, but it was bad. I mean, these, these let, let, let's compare this, like. I mean, those are teams that turned themselves around and got to the finals. Okay, they both lost, but they both got to the finals. They might have won those series actually in the finals if LeBron hadn't gotten in the tank in 2011 and if Kyrie hadn't gotten – Kevin Love hadn't gotten hurt in 2015. Like, he could have won championships those seasons that the media was freaking out, remember? Like, yeah. for the whole year. This team is, is nine and a half games behind the Danilo Gall- Gallinari-led Clippers. <laughs> nine and a half games. <laughs> How do you do that? I, I, How do you do that with LeBron James? Like, like the Clippers are are they're not tanking, but they're kind of are. Like they they were they were clearing cap space for a star. They had a perfectly good. 
player who is, in my view, Tobias Harris is a number two on a on an excellent team. Okay, at this stage, that's where he is. And they traded that guy to not pay that guy, at least not initially, so that they could clear cap space to get someone who's almost as good as LeBron in the off season. Like that's what they did. Like, they, and 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 we didn't blame them for it because we were like, eh. Clippers aren't going anywhere this year anyway. They might as well, right? Like, might as well. Jerry West knows what he's doing. Clear the cap space. Like, it's and they're nine and a half behind that. They are still. You mentioned the Kings, okay? You mentioned the Kings, and I, we, I, you know, we both predicted the Kings would fade, okay? Because they're not ready for this yet. I, I like their young core. And, and, and Bagley got hurt. Things. And Bagley got hurt. But they're three and a half behind the Kings. Like the Kings have faded. They're still just a game under five hundred. I mean, I think we thought maybe the Clippers would that the bottom would fall out with them. I mean, they're behind the Wolves, who traded their best player this year. Maybe Towns is their best player. He's one of their two best players, okay? Trade and, – and, and who aren't even getting anything from Covington now because he's hurt. They're a game and a half ahead of the Pelicans, same in the win column, a team whose superstar does not want to be there anymore and has made that clear. And is on like, a minutes restriction. Is, is on a minutes restriction. Like, to say this is a spectacular failure, I don't think does it justice. I mean, they could fall behind the Grizzlies who are 13th, they could fall behind the Mavericks. They could be 14th. Maybe they want to be right now. But they could be only ahead of the Suns, okay, who they lost to the other night. And, and so, I mean, the Laker organization, like, just – I don't want to hear from Laker fans ever again about anything, about anything. Like, they're the most arrogant – I mean, this Kobe thing, okay, by the way, check Dwayne's numbers, career and Kobe's numbers. Dwayne's are better. But, <laughs> okay, I just – I mean, that got 6,000 likes. I'm just throwing it back out there. They're better, okay, they're better. Per minute, they're, per, per possession, they're better. Um, I don't want to hear from Laker fans ever again about anything. Your organization is a shit show. How how do you finish eight games, or right now, eight games under 500? Okay, nine and a half games behind the other team in your building that has no stars with LeBron James playing. Like this thing earlier, like, okay, he missed time. He missed time. They're under 500 with him now. Yeah. So, like, uh, it's a, it's remarkable. Now, as far as his decision, look, I mean, you know I'm a LeBron stan. Okay, I tend to defend him for a lot of these things. I understood. I mean, it was time to get out of Cleveland. But I did say all offseason that Philly was the place. I mean, th- that was the place. If he wanted to win, that was the place. Okay? And it made sense for other reasons, too. It, I, now, I heard Savannah really didn't want to go there. Okay, maybe that played into this. But, like, it made sense because he was going to play with Simmons, who's the, who's the top guy other than Anthony Davis in his agency. Um, Embiid is a guy who would have taken pressure off him with the media. His skill set with Simmons was a difficult fit, but no more of a difficult fit than it is with Lance Stevenson, who he decided to go play with. Like, I, so he should have gone to Philadelphia, or he should have gone to Houston. Yeah, he should, have, and you know, he should have gone to Houston. Now Harden wouldn't be the MVP right now, and they would have had to figure out how to split that thing up. But if he wanted to win a championship. He could have gone to Houston. They haven't won a title with this group. And Houston's a great basketball city. Players love playing there. And if they took down this Golden State behemoth, he would have gotten credit for it. He would have gotten credit. He would have gotten credit in Philadelphia, too. But but to go to the Lakers, like, and I don't know who they're getting. Like, what, if you're a premium free agent, like, if you're Kawhi, you don't want to play there. You want to play with the Clippers. Clippers yeah. know what they're doing. No, I, I, and and, and I, th- um, I, think, I think a lot of people, including Windhorse, have talked about, you know, what what's the actual appeal of playing with LeBron James right now. And I think and, and you're kind of looking at the, at the chessboard right now. Like, LeBron's going to have to pull something off here, man, because I, I, it, I don't think he's getting Durant to go. I don't think he's getting Clay Thompson to go. I don't think he's getting Kawhi Leonard to go. I don't think he's getting Kyrie Irving to go. Those are kind of the four guys that right now are on the chessboard right now. So is LeBron James going to try and fix this next year with Jimmy Butler and DeMarcus Cousins coming in? Like I, I and and if that happens, how much better are they really? And because I, I don't think, particularly now with with Brandon Ingram having the blood clot thing, and obviously that's terrible for him and and terrible for the organization and just an all around scary situation that we know all too well here in Miami. But what is the Lakers' route to trading for Anthony Davis right now, especially when the New Orleans posture seems to be go bleep yourselves? We're not giving you Anthony Davis. Like you can try and get him in free agency in a year. We're going to trade him this summer to a team that we feel like is is going to is going to you know be able to get us something really important for our future. I don't think the Lakers can offer that right now. So I, I, unless they end up with the you know the number one pick against Zion, but like but I, I just don't know. Other than you know again being born on third base and getting the number one pick from this mini tank that they're going on right now what their route is out of this. And again, LeBron James has chosen a situation in which he's not in the best best opportunity to win, really in an opportunity to win. I mean, he, the Lakers are so far away right now, and Le- and LeBron has kind of had this thing where oh, you could put them on any team and they'd make the playoffs and they'd be competitive to go win the championship. But 
I mean, maybe this is the end of that era. That this is the end of that portion of his prime, and now they're going to need to put together a really good team. That route doesn't appear obvious, and I think LeBron has made a pretty sizable error here in where he's decided to go. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I, we, we always said they could put him on the Hinky Sixers, and they'd still make the playoffs. Yeah, but right now they're nine and a half games behind the uh, the Gallinari Clippers. Um, it's uh, <laughs> pretty pretty fascinating. The way that's played out. All right, real quick, we got to do this rapid fire here, and then we are playing Justice Better uh, to, to close this particular episode. Uh, to now that you've me a culprit officially for Heat Beat and for everybody else. Better position right now, 30 seconds or less. LeBron James going forward. Yeah. LeBron James or the Miami Heat? I'd still say the Lakers. <laughs> as, as, much, as much as I've just ranted and raved about them, at least they have a max salary slot in the summer and LeBron James. So I, I, as much as you know, maybe their young guys aren't panning out as bad as it is right now, I mean – they they could add a couple of players this summer and maybe pull off an Anthony Davis trade. Maybe you know just completely you know get lucky as hell and and get Zion with the number one pick in the draft or or something like that. I mean it's not out it's not out of the realm of possibility. So I would still say uh, the Lakers just by virtue of having LeBron. But I mean they still have a mountain to climb. I, I mean we're talking about them winning a championship. I think neither team is anywhere near winning a championship. But I would still say just by virtue of the fact that they have LeBron and they have cap space uh, and and their first round pick this year that they could maybe do something, but I'm I'm not entirely confident in their ability to achieve anything right now. Justice better. Play the song. <laughs> Pat Riley thinks that justice better now, better now. You better watch out now, his shot is found, shot is found. You know he's never gonna let you down, let you down. He'll give you everything a championship ring. It's for we know that justice better now, better now. From all his haters, we hear not a sound, not a sound. Celtics keep your offer, we will win slow. Devin Booker scoring, but his wins low. Justice to connection, call his friends low. 20 on his jersey, hustle, catching all lights. Only three years extend the rest of our lives. Put Charlotte on a poster, got it by the bedside. Remembering Toronto game seven at the five. New Kyle's told him, told him, told him, told him. That point, Justice is our special motor. Simmons probably trying to forget Cause Justice Winslow got a ball in his head Pat Riley thinks that Justice better now, better now You better watch out now, his shot is found, shot is found You know he's never gonna let you down, let you down He'll give you everything a championship ring And Spo, we know that Justice better now, better now From all his haters, we hear not a sound, not a sound Ilya Silva on the poster now, poster now He's better than Devin Stepping dudes, some have been critical of you, and yet you only 22. And I love it when you're on the break, and you dunk acting like something stank. You got so much time to learn the game, plus another year to play with Dwayne. Primarily, things are just as better now. Just as better now, better now. From all his haters, we hear not a sound, not a sound. Ilya Sova on a poster now, poster now. He's better than Devin is, he's better than Devin is. Oh, oh, oh. I promise, I swear to you, justice better. This man can play one through the five. Pat Riley thinks that just as better now, better now. You better Shot is found. Your boy just says we'll never let you down. Let you down. He'll give you everything a championship ring. And Spo, we know that just is better now. Better now. From all his haters, we hear not a sound. Not a sound. Ilya Silva on the poster now. Poster now. He's better than Devin is. He's better than Devin is. Oh. oh, oh. for listening to the Fire in the Podcast. Thank you so much.